Hi, everybody. How are you? My name is Jeannie Rosner. Welcome to Soul Food Salon. Super excited to have you all here today, um, kicking off our eighth year, which is fabulous. Um, just a little bit about me for those that don't know who I am. Um, I'm a retired pediatric anesthesiologist. I retired about a little over 10 years ago to start teaching nutrition, health and wellness in our local middle and high schools. And from there, I then wanted to educate uh, a broader audience, the adults essentially, and that's when I started Soul Food Salon in 2014. And we hold monthly events. Trying to, I try to alternate between um, a talk and a cooking event. And they've been, um, they were in person up until COVID, then they became virtual. And the hope was uh, for actually this September event to be a cooking event. And my thought is that Going forward, I'll have some kind of hybrid concept where the cooking events will be live and the talks will be virtual. And then when Delta reared its ugly head, we changed plans. So right now the cooking event that we have scheduled will be in November, assuming we can still hold it with a larger, larger audience. And that's when we um, put Annie in, in its place. So, um, so as I said, this is our eighth year. Our mission at Soul Foods Law is to educate and empower us all to be healthier. And we do that through these events. I do a lot of writing. We have a very active website, soulfoodsalon.com. Take a look at it. Everything that we've done in the past eight years is there. Past presentations, past articles that we've written, recipes, just as there's a wealth of knowledge on our website. So spend some time there. I am uh, very active on social media, mainly Instagram. So follow along. My logo is at soulfoodsalon, all one word. And as I mentioned, um, we also have a YouTube channel and that's at Soul Food Salon also. And all, many of our events have been recorded. This event is being uh, recorded as well. And I will, be, um, I will put it up on YouTube probably later tonight or early tomorrow, as soon as I can do a little bit of the editing. So um, you can subscribe to that. And you can also subscribe to getting my newsletter, which would then give you an email tomorrow morning with the actual link. And uh, again, you can just go on my website, soulfoodsalon.com and, and subscribe to everything. And you can be in touch with me there as well. So each year I partner with a different nonprofit and I, I kind of start my year in September, kind of the new school year, et cetera. So the new year is today starting and um, the nonprofit that we are partnered with this year is called Fresh Approach. The project that we are helping them with is helping to to start a mobile farmer's market in our local area in Redwood City. Easy to make a donation, soulfoodsalon.com, the middle uh, main page, the about page. There's a little uh, segment about who I'm partnered with for the year. A little bit of information takes you to the Fresh Approach website if you want to learn more about them. And then there's a link, a specific link that, that we created to make a donation to help support this project of getting the mobile farmer's market um, up and running in Redwood City. Okay, so our next event is on Thursday, October 14th. It will be virtual, and it's with Robert Lustig, who's an MD from uh, UCSF. He's a professor emeritus in the Division of Pediatrics and Endocrinology. And his topic is called Metabolical, How Processed Food Kills. He's a very blunt, amazing speaker. He had... Um, he has, I think, one of the most watched YouTube video. It's called Sugar, the Bitter Truth, and it's fascinating. Um, I will be sending out an email about his event shortly with a link to register. Um, if you're not on my email list, you can email me, Jeannie, J-E-A-N-N-E, -E, at soulfoodsalon.com, or go to my website and subscribe to being on my newsletter, which is Soulful Insights, and you'll be on the master list. Okay, so today I have the pleasure to introduce everyone to my dear, dear friend, Annie Fenn. Um, so Annie and I share the love of a lot of things. Uh, we met probably four or so years ago through a friend, and then we followed each other on Instagram. And then um, Annie did an event for me in October of 2019, which you can go on our YouTube channel and watch it. It's, it's a great uh, brain health kind of primer. And so Annie... Um, Annie left um, the world of OBGYN after she practiced for about 20 years and delved into the world of culinary arts, culinary medicine, and she started learning and teaching. And then in 2017, she founded Brain Health Kitchen. And she is a wealth of knowledge, extremely 
brilliant, actually, personable, fun, funny, just everything. So I um, welcome Annie to the floor. And so today, our event's going to be a little different than what we've done in the past. So it's going to be a live Q&A. We've culled many questions that, that you, the audience, have provided for us. And we have some supporting slides to um, back up some of the answers to the questions that I'm going to pose to Annie. Uh, we will do our best to get to the Q&A that's in our box. So go ahead and post questions, but we're going to try to get through most of this information initially. Hopefully we'll get through, hopefully it will be addressing many of the questions that you might still have. So um, Annie, come to the floor, please. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, how are you? Thank you. That was just about the nicest introduction I've ever listened to. Thank it's you. nice to see you. Thanks. Same here. So I think many people know who you are. Many people have read your information and all the things that you put out, but perhaps you can just kind of start giving us a little summary of who you are, you know, why you, why you've delved into this path, why you left OBGYN and just kind of a little bit more about brain health kitchen, et cetera. Sure, sure. So I'm basically a, a doctor who has always loved food and has been passionate about cooking my entire life. And so um, when I decided to retire about 20 years after practicing ob uh, I wanted to go back to school and I wanted to learn more about how the intersection of nutrition helps people live longer, more vital lives. So I went to culinary school with the idea in the back of my head that I wanted to learn how to make healthy food, really delicious, make it crave worthy, make it the type of food that everybody wants to eat all the time. Because I had seen firsthand in my practice um, that the people that had good lifestyle habits, especially healthy eating, they did so much better during menopause. They did better in the older adult years. They had less dementia from my anecdotal experience. And I just really wanted to share that with people. So in a roundabout way, I started diving into the field of nutrition and cognitive health. Uh, especially in 2015. And that year is when the Mind Diet study came out, which had a huge impression on me um, in terms of showing you could actually reduce Alzheimer's risk with food. And that was the same year that my mom was diagnosed with dementia. So I just read everything possible at the time that showed that you can actually slow down the aging of your brain based on the types of foods that you eat. So that's how I launched Brain Health Kitchen, which started out as a website, as a resource for people. Um, it's kind of a food blog with science too. I write articles on there. There's brain healthy recipes. There's a lot of information about how to cook if brain healthy techniques, which we can talk about. Um, but I mostly think of Brain Health Kitchen as a community. You know, since it started back in 2015, since I started teaching people in my home kitchen um, way back then, you know, it's become this community of people wherever I go in the US or around the world, that are just really proactive about their aging, proactive about taking care of their brains and wanna learn more about it. And so for me, it's this wonderful community that I've been privileged to be a part of. Great. So people can subscribe to your newsletter, correct? Uh, yes, I have a free newsletter. It goes out once a month. And I usually have a recipe or two or three in there that are unique for my newsletter crowd. And I give updates on the science, things I think that are applicable to real life, and I tell people where I'm gonna be, such as here or elsewhere doing hands-on cooking classes. Great, so um, you can access that through Annie's website. And mm -hmm. I will also um, share that in the, e it'll always be on my website under past events, all of Annie's contact information, as well as tomorrow's email that I will send out with the link to today's salon um, with her contact information. So let's like just delve into it. So let's go through like dementia is, is Alzheimer's the only diagnosis for a dementia diagnosis? Can you like differentiate how dementia is categorized perhaps? Absolutely, I have a slide for this. Oh no, I don't, do I? Um, it's an important <clears throat> question because, you know, we say Alzheimer's almost synonymously with dementia, but they're actually different things. Dementia is the umbrella term, um, which refers to cognitive decline, usually age related. Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. 70% of all dementias are from Alzheimer's, but there are other types as well. There's vascular dementia, which is a very important category that comes from having abnormal blood vessels, uh, mini strokes, things of that nature. Um, you know, there's things like Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal lobe dementia, dementia secondary to Parkinson's disease. 
and you know the the data that I'm presenting is may or may not be pertinent to these other types of dementias. Um, but I like to refer to studies because I am evidence based as a physician growing up um, through evidence based medicine. And what I like to present is the data that is the most solid. And a lot of these have done been done with Alzheimer's specifically. Right. But there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of crossover. So how big of a problem is this for us in the U.S., for example, um, is Alzheimer's? I think we do have a slide for that. So if you want to yeah, share. Yeah, we do. Um, so, you know, I was presenting at Woodside at your salon two years ago. And since then, I've had to change these numbers. It used to be there are somewhere around four and a half million Americans in the U.S. with Alzheimer's. But just in that short time span, it's gone up to 6.1. These are the newest 2021 numbers from the Alzheimer's Association facts and figures. Um, so the thing about this curve is that right now there's a lot of people with Alzheimer's in the world, about 50 million, and in the U.S., about 6 million. But what's really scary is what's going to happen in the next few decades. Um, look at this curve. I mean, by 2060, we we're going to have more than 14 million people with Alzheimer's in our country. And, you know, this is basically secondary, mostly to the aging of certain population, certain age groups that are at risk. You know, um, I'm a baby boomer. You're a baby boomer. If you're born between 1964 and 1946, you're a baby boomer, too. And it's the baby boomer balloon is really starting to have an effect on the incidence of Alzheimer's. Um, also, people in their and over 75 are living longer too, secondary to advances in cancer and cardiovascular disease and things like that. So what we're looking at is like a tsunami of Alzheimer's disease in the next couple of decades that's thought to, you know, it'll probably bankrupt Medicare. It'll change the way people live in cities. It'll change so much about our society. Um, and what I'm going to show you later is that a lot of this is preventable. You know, this curve does not have to happen. We can definitely put a huge dent in it. Another thing that's really important is that Alzheimer's affects women more than men. And if you've been to Aunt Jeannie's salons before, you've probably, you know, heard me say this. Um, you know, two thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are female. And we'll go into some information about why that might be as well. Great. So how does it like progress? Can you go through, you know, when, at what age should we be concerned that maybe it's starting in our brains, but we're not really showing symptoms? Is there a progression that we need to be aware of? There is progression. This is, this is everything. This is kind of a busy slide and I'll break it down for you in just a second. But, you know, we used to think that Alzheimer's just happened when you got older. Like you had an uncle who was 75 and he got Alzheimer's, meaning, you know, all of a sudden this happened to him. But um, now we know that it's actually a continuum that occurs over decades before you even have the first symptom, which is usually problems with memory, as most people know. And so, you know, it's good to think about Alzheimer's as a process, not because I want everyone to be like worried about the fact that they're getting Alzheimer's at middle age. Um, but the fact of the matter is we're all um, building up these things that lead to Alzheimer's later. Um, and there's things we can do to reduce that is kind of the point. So if you look at this, if this slide, um, this looks at the biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease over time in, in a person's life. You look at age at the bottom and you look at the amount of dysfunction and, and cognitive function. So one of the biomarkers for Alzheimer's a biomarker is just something you can measure, like a blood test for blood sugar is a biomarker. An MRI scan of the brain is a biomarker. It's a measurable thing in medicine. So amyloid beta plaques, as most people have heard of, are the sticky proteins that accumulate in the brain that can lead to dysfunction and inevitably full-blown Alzheimer's later. Um, so people are starting to develop amyloid plaques in the brain way before they are starting to have any symptoms, if you can see. Um, and what age is that roughly, would you say? It depends. If in a, in a person who doesn't have uh, a genetic predisposition, like there is something called early onset Alzheimer's that afflicts people before the age of 60, which is very rare, less than 3%. But this is what you hear about when people have Alzheimer's in their 40s and 50s. That's early onset. That's kind of a whole other very rare thing. Okay. What we're talking about is adult onset Alzheimer's, usually over the age of 60s when it presents. And in someone with that scenario, they're starting to build up these biomarkers starting in their 30s and 40s. Gotcha. Yeah. 
So, so amyloid plaque is a big one. Um, you start to see a decline in synaptic function. That's, that's how cells communicate between each other. You start to see tau tangles. That's another protein that people might recognize from, from the news that you know there's lots of drug companies trying to target both amyloid and tau. Um, you start to see brain shrinkage in medicine is called atrophy. It's one of the signs we see on MRIs that are indicative of dementia or Alzheimer's is that the brain actually shrinks in volume over time. Um, and that's hugely important because you wanna maintain a robust blood brain volume for as long as you can in life. Brain volume is everything. Brain volume is neurons, it's connections, it's all these collateral tracks inside your brain. Um, cognition is, is thinking, you know, how well you can think in terms of memory, executive function, things like that. And then the final phase is dysfunction, meaning um, you can't live a normal life anymore because you can't take care of yourself and you need to be taken care of. So the, the Alzheimer's staging has changed recently. Uh, it used to be purely clinical, meaning doctors giving patients um, memory tests or some or cognitive tests and making a diagnosis that way. And now since we have this technology with how measuring amyloid beta, measuring tau, looking at brain MRIs, which has been huge for this field, um, there's a preclinical pre stage called stage zero, where people actually have evidence of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, but they don't have any symptoms at all. Hmm. You know, when I talk about nutrition and Alzheimer's, I'm talking a lot to people in stage zero. That's like basically most of us in middle age are in stage zero, most likely. Probably have some evidence if we looked hard enough of these things in our brains. Um, However, because, the, because there's, there are plaques that doesn't necessarily mean that we are going to go along on that whole continuum, correct? No, absolutely not. And that's one of the trickiest things in this field is trying to figure out who's going to progress to overt Alzheimer's and who is not. Because as you know, there have been studies of people who at autopsy, their brains are riddled with plaques and tangles, but they never had any symptoms when they're alive. And those people somehow develop collateral connections within their brain that were meaningful that prevented them from actually getting the symptoms of Alzheimer's. So we can talk about that a little bit too. So basically we need to get our, um, increase our cognitive reserve so that we have the collaterals to hopefully help prevent this. Absolutely, I think a lot of that is cognitive reserve. And if that's a new term for you, cognitive reserve means um, it's all the intellect that you accumulate in your life. It's all the books you've read, it's the languages, it's the music, it's all the things that you've tried to learn. It's the sports you've learned. It's the different ways of movement that you've learned. Dance is really important. All of these things build up and can make more rich and different channels in your brain. And so that people with high cognitive reserve have a much lower likelihood of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's later. Okay. So I know that you, you spend a lot of your time um, reviewing the studies, but a big focus is food. So let's go into that. Is there, are there any dietary, I mean, I know there are some, so can you please share some of the diet, dietary uh, evidence on how sure. um, ways that are brain healthy for us? Sure, let's talk about the food. So I always have to show this because the Mediterranean diet is the most studied dietary <clears throat> pattern that shows that it improves cognition, reduces age-related cognitive decline, actually reduces Alzheimer's risk and vascular dementia risk. So it's hugely important. Um, and this is, you know, this is nothing new for most people, I am sure. Um, so the Mediterranean diet kind of started it all. And then some other studies built on that. And the MIND diet, which I mentioned earlier, basically what the Rush University researchers who presented that data um, did is they looked at this pyramid and they said, okay, what are the brain healthiest foods? Mediterranean diet was not, you know, it's not like a brain specific thing. Um, but what are the brain healthiest foods in this pyramid? And how could we make our own pyramid specific to preventing age related cognitive decline? So what they found was, well, getting back to the Mediterranean diet, we know that people who follow it most rigorously and there's criteria for this dietary pattern, um, in terms of how many fruits and vegetables you eat, how much fish and seafood, olive oil, things like that. People have 40% less Alzheimer's disease following the Mediterranean diet. And that's pretty good, right? So the MIND diet researchers were out to see if they could get this any higher. Can you reduce even more Alzheimer's disease with a dietary pattern? We know that the Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet reduces your risk of heart attack and stroke by 30%. That's huge. That's been replicated in many studies. Predimed was the big one. 
that um, was called into question, but the data was really still the same after they redid it. Um, what we found also when they go back and look at the Mediterranean diet through the lens of just brain health, we found that people have improved cognition over time and also reduced biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. So those biomarkers that we looked at, the amyloid, the tau, the brain shrinkage, um, we have a lot of MRI data now showing that if you follow a standard American diet or something like that, and you switch to the Mediterranean diet, after just three years, you will have a reduction in biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease evident in your brain. And that's really a short time, like in the brain world, you know, in terms of seeing changes. And th this is from one of Dr. Lisa Moscone's papers. She studies the brain as a neuroscientist at Cornell Weill University. And she actually showed that the Western diet, which is the, the one on the right-hand side, which is the standard American diet, um, people have more shrinkage in their brain. Look how big the vacuoles are, that's fluid. They have less gray matter, more fluid. It's retracting from the skull. Um, compared to the Mediterranean diet. And specifically in the hippocampus, you see this structure, this small horseshoe shaped structure at the base of the brain, the hippocampus is where Alzheimer's starts. It's where our memory center lies, our short-term memories get processed there and turned into long-term ones. Um, and there seems to be a, a real difference in the volume of the hippocampus in the Mediterranean diet versus the Western diet. So that's super important. That's Here's the same slide again they found twice the brain volume in those following a Mediterranean diet. Wow. Yeah, I want, I want this brain, right? <laughs> so then- I don't, I don't want to have this brain. <laughs> so, can, so let's expand, I think, um, can we go into the mind diet a little bit? Sure, let's go through this. Um, this is gonna be a little bit of a review for the people that came to the talk in 2019, but it's a lot of data, so it's always good to review it. Um, this is the actual study. In case you're wondering what MIND stands for, it's Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. It's a, it's a mouthful. Um, it's basically a hybrid of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, which is a diet that's very well studied and effective for reducing hypertension and cardiovascular disease in people. So they took these two really good, you know, well-studied diets, put them together, and then looked at these people prospectively, meaning they had about a thousand people in the study with healthy brains, no evidence of dementia, and then they followed them for about four and a half years. And what they found was that the people that followed the MIND diet most closely had a 53% reduction in Alzheimer's after four and a half years. So these are people that had no, no evidence of dementia at the onset of the study. And one of the reasons the study is so powerful is that the researchers were super careful to screen out for dementia. It's one of the problems with studies. You know, you have to look at um, how did they evaluate these people <clears throat> for memory loss or dementia. Um, and one of the things that I love about MIND diet is they're very rigorous in the way that they did that. And here's another really cool thing about the study is that, you know, not everyone followed the diet as rigorously as uh, the researchers would like. So, you know, cause it's really hard to follow a diet. I don't even like the word diet. I, I like to think of, um, what we eat is, is a pattern, not a strict diet that you have to follow. Um, but anyways, the cheaters of the diet, the people who did not follow it very well, they still had a 37% reduction in Alzheimer's risk, which was remarkable. I mean, in 2015 and still, there's really no drug, there's no pill, there's no nothing, no intervention that can reduce your risk just with one thing by that much. That's great. Um, the other thing that was really important with the MIND diet is they showed improved cognitive function, like some of those Mediterranean diet studies had shown. So, so what's actually in the diet? Well, it was kind of brilliant. They broke it down into 10 brain healthy food groups and five brain harming food groups. And this has been, this was a real, a real um, help for me when I was starting the cooking school, because I find this is just a really easy way for people to think about what they eat through the lens of brain health. Um, and it's, it's not like a super rigorous uh, you know, diet that you have to stick to. It's more like, try to choose more of this, try to eat less of that. So I think it's very easy for people to assimilate this into their lives based on what they like to eat. Um, the 10 food groups, now this is the original Mind Diet study 2015. And we'll go into how this has changed a little with the ongoing study that they're doing. But berries is its own food group, leafy greens, other vegetables, nuts, beans, 
whole grains, fish, as long as it's not fried, poultry, as long as it's not fried, olive oil is used as its primary cooking oil, and red wine up to five ounces a day. And that was based on the, Med the Mediterranean diet studies. I find it's interesting how, um, and you, you pointed this out last time for us, how leafy greens is its own food group versus being incorporated in the vegetables. Just It just shows how important all the, all the rich nutrients that are in the leafy greens. It's so. so true. And leafy greens has its own, the reason they, they pulled leafy greens out of the vegetables, that big stack of vegetables in the Mediterranean pyramid, they pulled it out because it has its own body of data, its own like stack of papers. One of them has, is MRI data showing that if you eat a salad that's about one and a half cups raw of leafy greens a day, um, your brain on MRI looks 11 years younger than someone who eats leafy greens rarely. So just that one, that one little change, maybe a slightly bigger salad and maybe every day instead of every couple of days can really have an impact on your brain longevity. The other one they pulled out was berries because berries, everyone knows berries are good for their brain. The reason is they have high doses of flavanols, especially anthocyanin, which may reduce that amyloid accumulation in the brain over time. Um, it has a lot of antioxidants, it's a high fiber food. So it's probably like the most nutrient dense of all the fruits. So it's the only really fruit that's mentioned in my diet, interestingly. It Not that other fruits are bad, but it's the only one that had like enough data to call it out as its own. Exactly. So do you want to go through the five brain? Yeah, what? So I like to think of it as limit or avoid because, you know, chances are you're never going to, um, you know, avoid these completely unless you're like the best eater on earth, right? But fried and fast food is a big category. In the mind diet, they, they recommend less than a serving each week, which I think is doable for most people, unless you're in the habit of getting your lunch at a fast food restaurant most days, then that would need to change. Uh, red meat, they list as a food to limit, and they define this as less than four servings a week, and a serving size is three ounces. That's about the size of a deck of cards. That's, that's, a, that's a fairly small piece of, of meat, basically. They don't go into the type of meat. There's been a lot of data lately about processed meats versus more natural meats like grass-fed beef. And the newest data on meat is actually a lot more positive, although I still think that these, this portion is kind of high, honestly. Um, butter and stick margarine, less than a tablespoon a day. Cheese, less than two servings a week. And pastries and sweet, less than five servings each week. So the common denominator with all these food groups is, well, number one, saturated fat. The brain healthy diet is not a low fat diet. It's actually really about 40% fat. It's mostly healthy fats though, what we call, what I call brain friendly fats, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated from the omega-3s, but it's very low in saturated fat. It's less than 5% saturated fat. And Dr. Martha Claire Morris, who did, who was one of the lead researchers on the Mind Diet study, she actually had done papers previously showing that the amount of saturated fat in your diet is directly correlated with your Alzheimer's risk. So the more fatty foods you eat, the greater your risk of Alzheimer's. And so, so can you maybe share your thoughts on coconut oil? Cause that it is a, is a fat. And I know that there've been some studies, maybe more anecdotal about it being helpful for brain health. Well, coconut oil, the whole story is very interesting. I've been following it for years. Coconut oil is primarily saturated fat. So it's certainly not something I cook with very often. It's not something I want people to have in their dietary pattern very often. I would put it in this category, honestly. It is not a brain healthy food. It has been marketed as a brain healthy food. And a lot of people are marketing it from the viewpoint that it contains a certain type of uh, fatty acid called medium chain triglycerides or MCTs. You know, some people take MCT oil and they put it in their coffee or they use it as like a brain, a brain supplement. Um, there's really not much data for that. And what you're doing when you're adding coconut oil or MCTs like that is you're just increasing the saturated fat in your diet. If you like to cook with coconut oil, you know, that's fine. I cook with it sometimes too because of the flavor, but I use really small amounts. It's certainly not, you know, an important part of my diet. The, um, there was a good study that actually finally came out about last year, I don't know if you remember this one, Jeannie, but they showed that people who consume coconut oil as their primary cooking oil, as opposed to other more brain-friendly ones like olive oil, they actually do raise their harmful cholesterol significantly. 
In this study, their, their LDL went up by 9%. Their total cholesterol went up. Their triglycerides went up. And, you know, as physicians, and that, that's not something we want to see. It's not a trend you want to see. Um, so it's, it's Bottom impactful. line is you can use coconut oil, but very sparingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sparingly. Um, olive oil should be your primary cooking oil. We can talk about some other oils as well. So I know that you, um, for those that don't know, Annie has worked tirelessly all through COVID on creating a brain healthy cookbook, which will probably be out within maybe a year or so. And I believe you have kind of a little nuance about the mind diet pyramid or stratification. I do. You want to go through I that? I do. Maybe? Yeah, I've been I've been working diligently, you know, trying to get ingredients during the pandemic, and my oven broke in Mar May, and it's in March, and it still hasn't been a delivered a new one. So I've had all sorts of like pandemic related um, things happen, but the joy the joy for me of the pandemic was diving into this book, and so I'm creating my own guidelines because the mind guidelines, the mind diet guidelines are great. It's the best science we have about how to eat to prevent cognitive decline. But since 2015, there's a lot that's been happening in the scientific literature. I'll go back to my previous slide. You know, number one, um, you know, their evidence is building that the more plant-based your dietary pattern is, the better it's going to be to reduce your Alzheimer's risk. And I really believe this to be true. So when I look at leafy greens, a cup a, a cup um, a day, you know, I just don't think that's enough. So I'm bumping that up to about two cups a day. That's like a that's a big salad, and I cook with my leafy greens too. I throw handfuls of spinach and arugula in sautés and stews. I'm sure you guys do as well. Um, when it comes to berries, you know, the data to reduce Alzheimer's risk supports two half cup servings a week, but there's also data to support that if you have a half cup serving every day or most days, you will do better on memory tests. And the study was done in women um, over the age of 60. So I think there's evidence to say that you should eat berries every day if you can. Don't stress out about it if you can't, but definitely start putting up berries for winter so that you have a constant supply to put in your smoothies and your oatmeal and things like that. When it comes to other vegetables, one cup a day, I just don't think that's enough, honestly. I would bump, up, bump that up to two or three cups a day. And I would make sure that at least a third to a half of the vegetables that you eat are cruciferous. It's the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, like cauliflower, like Brussels sprouts, cabbages, things like that, that are shown most to have the strong, the potent antioxidants like sulforaphane. Um, and they're also super high in fiber. So you want these high fiber sulforaphane rich vegetables in your diet. Um, I'm really good with nuts. I probably eat more nuts than this because I have replaced dairy in my diet, mostly with uh, nut-based milks, which I love because they're delicious. And I also think they give you a lot of bang for your buck in terms of giving, putting antioxidants into you know, what you like to drink. Um, beans, this is great. Three or more half cup servings a week. That's tough for some people. I think that's a good amount to shoot for. Whole grains, three or more half cup servings a day. That's great. Um, you have to make sure that your grains are truly whole grain. We can talk about that. Fish not fried one or more servings a week. This is this is great. You know, Dr. Morris showed that your Alzheimer's risk doesn't really go down more if you eat more fish. However, there's some new data that looks at people who are at risk for Alzheimer's because they have the ApoE4 genetic variant. And it's very possible that these people, which about 20% of the population carries ApoE4, should probably eat more fish. They should probably eat two or three servings of high quality fish a week um, because of the DHA that provides. They need more DHA than the average person because they have an inability to transport it across the blood brain barrier. Can so I, 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 would, I would amend that a little bit. Let me interrupt you for a second about the APOE4. So is that a blood test? Is, can I just go to my doctor and get, get APOE status? Like you can, you can, it's a blood test. A lot of people um, used to check it through 23andMe. I don't know if they're still offering that as part of the 23andMe panel. Uh, it's, it's really important to talk to your physician about it. And, and ideally you talk to a genetic counselor if you're thinking about getting an APOE4 test done because you know there's a lot of stress and anxiety around these tests when they come back positive. If you're APOE4 positive, it doesn't mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's. In fact, it's, it's probably overwhelmingly more likely they're not going to get Alzheimer's. It just means your risk goes up a little bit. But, you know, I, I like to think uh, of it as a risk modifying test. Like if you get your test done 
and you're not going to freak out about it if it's positive, it might help you change certain behaviors that we know will decrease your risk. Um, but certainly not for everyone. And I think it requires a lot of discussion. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and then poultry. So, you know, the Mind Diet researchers, they included poultry initially because, well, this is what Dr. Morris told me personally um, when she came out to Jackson and did some events with me. She's, they were really interested in the choline and the lutein, which are two very brain health, important brain health nutrients in the poultry. And they didn't really think that people would accept this dietary pattern without some sort of meat like poultry. And poultry was the easiest one. So since then, I don't know. I mean, poultry is such a, such a big source of saturated fat in the American diet that I really have mixed feelings about it. Although most people, when they eat poultry in America, it's a fried chicken sandwich. Fried chicken sandwiches are so popular in fast food outlets and elsewhere. Um, so I think that poultry is fine. I don't know if you need to get two more servings a week. I actually lump all the meat in my guidelines into up to four a week. So that's red meat, which includes lamb and, and pork and other things and poultry and turkey and things like that. And what about uh, poultry, you know, eating mostly the breast or the white meat and not the skin? How is the sat, how's the fat content then? Yeah, the, the saturated fat is primarily in the skin. Cooking methods are really important here. I'm not saying, you know, you'll have to eat just plain chicken breasts rather than thighs. I cook with chicken thighs too because I like the flavor better, um, but there is a little bit more saturated fat in it. And the way I ameliorate that is whenever I eat something like chicken or red meat, I make sure I have a ton of leafy greens and vegetables with it. Like three quarters of the plate should be these plant foods, honestly. And some studies show that if you eat a high quality meat or chicken, with that, that kind of you know, plate, plated with all these vegetables, then it's gonna reduce a lot of the, um, you know, the inflammatory things from the food that you're getting. So the portion size is really key and what you eat with it is really key as are the cooking methods, which I'll go into a lot in my book. Great. So I, I wouldn't put poultry in this food group anymore. Um, I would call it optional. People like chicken, so it's probably fine. Olive oil is your primary cooking oil, totally agree. Uh, red wine, you know what, I moved this to the other category in my book. I'm moving it to foods to limit or avoid. Up to five ounces a day is what they showed in the Mediterranean diet studies, and that's great, but I don't see people drinking like that in America. People drink a lot more. They drink bigger glasses of wine and more of it on occasion. Um, and there's some new data and we, that we can go into that showed that that is, is probably detrimental to our, our brains long term. So there have been, there, I'm just kind of looking through the, the questions that you all are posting and just in sync with the topic right now. So you talk about olive oil. Um, do you worry about um, hitting it too high because it has this lower smoke point than um, other oils? I know you talked at one point about combining the olive oil maybe with some avocado oil at one point. You want to, uh -huh. can you talk about that? Yeah, so, the, so you don't need a lot of oil in your kitchen. I, I would say get rid of all of the junky oils, which I would call inflammatory. Um, all you really need are an everyday olive oil that's extra virgin, maybe a high-end olive oil that's also extra virgin. That's like your drizzling oil. It might be, maybe it's from Italy or a really nice place in California where it's more expensive and it has great flavor. You're paying for the flavor, so you don't want to cook with it as much. And then use that for most of your cooking under 400 degrees Fahrenheit. If you want to sear a piece of fish or a piece of meat in a pan, which I would do very gently, mind you, um, I would use an avocado oil because it has a higher smoke point, or I would use a pecan oil, which I love. Um, I wouldn't use grapeseed oil. I think there's too many omega-6 fatty acids in grapeseed, which are pro-inflammatory, meaning they cause more inflammation. So I would stay away from grapeseed, which a lot of people use. Canola can be okay. It's um, often a GMO products. So you have to get you know, like a, a really good organic product of canola oil. The fat profile is not nearly as good as avocado oil. So if I had to choose, I would definitely go with avocado oil. And sometimes I mix it. Sometimes I'm, you know, I want the flavor of olive oil, but I want a little higher smoke point. So I'll mix my olive oil 50-50 with my avocado oil. I do that a lot. Okay, great. Um, one other question um, that, cause we talked a little bit about coconut oil. Mm -hmm. um, a question is, can you comment on, on other coconut products such as coconut milk, coconut water, um, how good or bad are they for our health? Uh, most coconut water, if you look at the label, has a lot of sugar in it. 
So I don't recommend drinking it. I don't recommend it as a sports recovery drink. I don't recommend putting it in your smoothies. There's probably some products that don't have a lot of sugar. So I would go and look at that nutrition label, look at the added sugar line and see. But I don't think coconut water is really all that good for you. It does have electrolytes in it. So there's that. Um, other coconut products, I mean, coconuts are just marketed to be good for you, but almost all the products that you get from them are going to be higher in saturated fat, like the coconut milk, especially. You can get a low fat type, and that's the kind I usually tend to cook with. Um, I do use coconut palm sugar in my baking because it's a little bit sweeter than normal cane sugar, so I use less of it. So I'm always trying to get the sugar in my, my cooking down, down as low as possible. With baking, it gets tricky because sugar provides structure and coconut palm sugar is the closest thing I have found to granulated sugar. You know, to, if you want to get like a nice dome on your muffins or something like that. And also, I mean, I just made your blueberry hemp banana muffins, uh, which are fabulous. If you guys want a great recipe, find it on Annie's um, website. At, but you use coconut palm sugar in that and you had mentioned a little bit about that it has a lower glycemic index as well. Do you want to talk? Because I know we're going to talk a yeah. little bit about sugar and it and does have a it. slightly lower glycemic index, meaning it may not cause as much of a spike in your blood sugar and thus your insulin. But I don't want to like highlight that so much just because sugar is really is sugar and we should be eating less of it is the bottom line. And when right. we're baking, we should try to get to them to the minimum. Um, there are some artificial sweeteners people are using. I've been messing around with a uh, monk fruit sweetener which, uh, you know, I have had mixed results with baked goods. I like, I like my food to turn out really well. And so I have a hard time sometimes with some of these substitutes. Right. Okay. Um, so you, t you talk about wine, you want to go into alcohol. Is there, aren't there some new, is there new data? There is some new data. This, I don't know if this hit the news yet because this was released at a conference, this study out of the UK um, earlier this year. And it was published in the British Medical Journal, but I don't know if it was, um, it was online, but not published in the actual journal. So I don't know if this actually hit the news for most people, but they did a really big study, 25,000 participants in the UK Biobank. And what they showed was that the levels of alcohol that we have been thinking are okay, what we've been calling moderate drinking, which is one, one drink per day for women or two drinks per day for men, it's probably a little bit too much in terms of long-term brain health. And what they found was not only um, more brain shrinkage over time, which has been proven before, but they also showed less gray matter, which is the neurons, and less white matter, which is all the myelin sheaths and, and synapses and things around the neurons. So they came out with the recommendation that there is no lower limit that is safe for your brain for drinking alcohol. Um, other studies have shown that under six drinks a week, for most people, you will not find any detriment long-term to your brain health, um, and you may have some benefit. So there is a sweet spot, it seems. All the, all the, there's lots, lots of studies on this, and it's always a U-shaped curve. Um, people that don't drink alcohol at all, they have an increased risk of Alzheimer's. But that can be confounded by the fact that people who are ill don't drink alcohol. Um, so that's always a problem with those studies. People that drink a small amount of alcohol, they have a decreased risk of Alzheimer's over time. And then it starts to go up, you know, with the amount that you drink. And what's happening with the research right now is we're just trying to narrow in on what is the safe amount and what is the amount that we really need to avoid. So I, I'm advocating being a light drinker, not a moderate one. A light drinker is someone who has one to six drinks per week. A drink is five ounce glass of wine, which is actually quite a small pour by American standards. This is probably a seven ounce pour right here. And so what I do is I use real, I love red wine. I mean, my husband collects wine. We, we love wine. Um, so what we do is we get really small wine glasses <laughs> to trick our brains into thinking we have a full glass and that works for me. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. I think our next topic that we wanted to address was intermittent fasting. Is there anything, any benefits of intermittent, intermittent fasting in relation to dementia reduction? This is such a good topic. I'm so glad a lot of the audience brought this up in the 
questions beforehand. So intermittent fasting, there was a good paper that came out in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago. All the physicians around the country just breathe a big sigh of relief because this has been on the layperson's radar for a long, long time, um, but there hasn't been a lot of good data. So doctors never know quite what to say about it, you know? Um, but basically there's three ways you can do this when you're engaging in intermittent fasting. You can do time-restricted eating, which is basically restricting the, the time of that you're eating to eight to 16 hour window. And the easiest way to do this is while you're sleeping. You know, you let's say 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., something like that. Um, so you basically have an early dinner and a late breakfast. And that way you widen the amount of time where there's no food at all in your system. Another one is alternate day fasting, fast every other day, limiting your intake to 500 calories on fasting days. The third one is the fasting mimicking diet, consume very few calories for five days every month for three months. Now, the reason this is so incredibly popular is, of course, people always want to lose weight. And these, you know, this started in Italy, where this physician in Italy started treating people for weight loss with intermittent fasting, and he got some mixed results. So people have been able to lose weight doing this. When you actually study this, though, the, the studies are really mixed, and it seems to work better for men than women when it comes to weight loss in terms of keeping the weight off. You know, weight loss studies have to be followed out for, you know, a year or maybe even more to see if they really stick. And so that's been the problem. A lot of these studies in humans are short term. And most of the studies we have on intermittent fasting and its impact on the brain have been done in animals. There's tons of animal data. If you read um, Dr. Sanjay Pandas, uh, he has a book and he's a researcher at Scripps, one of the first people to really start to study this in a rigorous way. Um, you know, you will, you will be fascinated by all the effects it has on animals' brains. And we're just starting to see that in humans. So there's a few things that we can probably say. Um, it does reset insulin resistance, which may help with weight loss. And I think that's probably one of the biggest benefits of any kind of intermittent fasting, if you are trying to lose weight, is it may reset your insulin receptors. And that's really important for um, in looking at it through the lens of brain health, because Alzheimer's is basically a type of insulin resistance. The hippocampus, that memory center we talked about earlier, it actually becomes insulin resistant. It changes the way it um, reacts to insulin based on your glucose in your blood. So insulin resistance is huge and you wanna decrease that in a way you can. Um, it stimulates the lymphatic system. And this is a, a, like a garbage disposal in your brain that helps clear up amyloid and tau. And I have a couple slides for this. We can go into this in more. It stimulates brain-drive neurotropic factor. This has been described as miracle growth for your brain, which increases the growth of neurons, reduces neuron cell death, um, helps brains age better. You know, it's, it's basically does everything that's good for brains. And there are some small studies that show it improves memory by as much as 20% in healthy older adults. So there's that. But it's still a big question mark as to the real brain benefits. We'd like to see some more solid data. The downside out, like I said, the studies are small. They're not long-term enough, mostly from animals. When it comes to Alzheimer's prevention, and this goes for the ketogenic diet as well, we don't have any solid data that shows that eating this way can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's. We just don't. Um, it's interesting because you'll read that doctors are starting to give people who already have Alzheimer's uh, a plan that includes a ketogenic diet or some form of fasting. And that's because when the brain is riddled with Alzheimer's, it can no longer use glucose for its energy. It has, to, it has to use ketones, which are more prevalent in this other type of diet. But for a normal brain that's trying to prevent Alzheimer's, it's, we still don't know, honestly. Uh, men more than women. Okay, here's the thing about both the keto diet, which we had some questions about, and fasting you have to be really careful about. I think you can do a ketogenic diet in a brain healthy way, if you're very strategic and very smart. But what I see is that it reduces the amount of brain healthy foods that you eat. You know, if your window is really short, you have to eat a lot of food in a short period of time. And also because you might be looking at less, trying to eat less carbs than usual, a lot of the carbs in your diet are, come from fruits and vegetables. So I just, I just feel like the ketogenic diet maybe limits a lot of the foods that I, I want people to eat a lot of, like all those leafy greens, all those vegetables, all those berries. Um, you have to be careful for muscle loss, especially in women. 
if you if you tend to lose weight in these fasting regimens, which a lot of women do, um, you have to be careful that you're not losing muscle too, because after a certain age, uh, it's really difficult to get muscle gains back once they've been lost. If you've been working out your whole life, you probably know that once you hit your 50s, it's really hard to maintain muscle mass. You have to work a little bit harder. And then eating this way is contraindicated in certain people. I mean, we do not recommend it for pregnant women, anyone with a history of disordered eating, anyone who's underweight has a low blood sugar. And ideally, people would do this under the care of a physician to make sure that, number one, they don't have diabetes or hypoglycemia or anything of those order, those things. Mm. Okay. So another um, area that I want to focus on, um, which were some questions that we received, is all about sleep. And I think um, anybody that is paying attention to the literature sees something new in the literature, that and the microbiome actually, but just how important both of those areas are to our health and having not only it's not only is it the quantity of sleep, but it's the quality of sleep that's important. So is there anything new in the research um, concerning sleep and brain health? Yeah, there, there are some cool things that have come out. The most important thing is all this, all this stuff about the glymphatic system in the brain that I mentioned earlier. So this is a relatively new phenomenon. It was just discovered um, about eight, eight years ago that there's a system in your brain for cleaning out toxins. So back when you and I were in medical school, Jeannie, no one even knew like what all these big vacuoles in your brain were for. And it was just postulated that it was just empty space for fluid. So now we know that while you sleep, there's a pressure gradient that gets set up in your brain that actually shrinks it temporarily. And it squeezes the fluid out into the cerebral spinal fluid, which goes back into your spinal column and eventually gets excreted. And some of the toxins that get excreted this way are amyloid and tau protein. And the process is called autophagy, which is a word that literally means um, digesting yourself, like the brain's digesting itself. It's not really doing that. It's just flushing out toxins like a garbage disposal. And so this, gr this gr grammatic shows that in a young, healthy brain, you know, you're, these are, these are the sticky proteins or like say toxins, these yellow and purple things that you don't really want. And they get flushed out pretty easily. As you get older, that becomes more difficult. And as uh, you see in people, as they develop Alzheimer's disease, their blood brain barrier is no longer nice and tight like this. We used to think that the blood brain barrier was just this ironclad wall where things do not get through it. Mm -hmm. And now we know that there's all sorts of things that can pass through the blood brain barrier, not even just you know with age or Alzheimer's, but in normal life. And you see how these um, little junctions are opening up. That's because these toxins are getting into the interstitial part of the cells and they're depositing in the brain in places you don't want on top of the cells. And then they get inside the cells and cause problems. Um, that is basically the clearance mechanism that fascinating. doesn't happen. It's really fascinating. Is there anything we can do sleep? I mean, what are some suggestions that you have? Okay, so this was the new part. This was the, this, this data is a, is a few years old, but I just came across a paper recently that looked at um, what are the lifestyle factors you can do to activate your lymphatic system. And the number one, it, one is sleep, getting back to sleep. 90% of this happens while we are sleeping. And it's that slow wave sleep that's really important to um, set up the pressure gradient. And slow wave is it's sort of when you are, you know, you fall asleep and then an hour later, you're super deep, deep, deep sleep. Remember getting woken up by beepers <laughs> in the middle of the night? Um, when we used to have beepers for cell phones, um, when we get called to the hospital, that was always the worst time for me. It was like an hour after I fell asleep. I was in the throes of slow wave sleep. It's very deep. Um, and the other important time is your REM sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep. And a lot of that happens in the middle of the night or later in the night before you wake up. And that's when you're actively dreaming. So most of this happens when you're sleeping. So if you don't have a good sleep pattern, if you don't pay attention to what we call sleep hygiene, um, like going to bed at the same time every night, like not eating before bed, like limiting your alcohol intake so that you know, it doesn't disrupt your sleep cycles, things like that, then you're not getting the benefit of this lymphatic system. And, you know, like that slide we showed way at the beginning, we're all kind of accumulating amyloid. It's not so much how much you accumulate, although that's important, but it's also like how much you can clear, like how much of this are you able to clear during your normal course of your life? 
Um, omega-3 consumption, interestingly, also activates the lymphatic system. And we, we're going we're to talk about omega-3s a little bit later. Intermittent fasting can do it, like we just talked about. Sleeping position, right side is better than left side, which is better than your back of your stomach. So it's kind of like um, if anyone here was pregnant, you know, we used to tell you to sleep on your left side. Well, the right side is actually better for your brain, for your lymphatic system. But I think if you go between right and left, it's, it's, uh, it's about the same. Alcohol, interestingly, low levels, like we were talking about under seven a week, um, can actually stimulate the lymphatic system, but higher levels do the opposite. Mm -hmm. Exercise stimulates it, 150 minutes a week, moderate, or 75 minutes of vigorous. And then, of course, chronic stress accelerates the accumulation of beta in animal studies. So we're thinking stress is what kind of, you know, undermines the galactic system. Basically. Cool. So let's let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you practiced OBGYN, so you dealt with women and hormones and menopause. And so can we talk a little bit about estrogen and perhaps why women are more prone to being diagnosed with Alzheimer's and just kind of delve into the whole estrogen hypothesis a little bit? Absolutely. I love this topic, as you may suspect. I practiced menopause for the last eight years in my practice. I've been following this data since the 80s, since I was a resident. I did a grand rounds on perimenopause back then, and no one had ever even heard the term perimenopause. It was brand new then. So I've definitely been interested in this in a really long time, and I'm so, so happy to see that we're getting some good studies coming out, really just in the last five years, a lot of them, um, thankfully, because of MRI data and some attention to the brain. Um, so one, one big picture concept that is really evolving is that estrogen, and I'm talking about the hormone estrogen that your body makes, endogenous estrogen, is neuroprotective. It does so much for women's brains. And some new studies that came out, this one was in 2019. I don't know if anyone saw the Wall Street Journal um, article about it, which was a big deal for men, people following menopause. Never gets any good press, you know? Um, but in 2019, it was found that the more your body is exposed to estrogen, the lower a woman's risk of dementia. So we're talking about endogenous estrogen. And so what they did was they compared people with the most estrogen rich cycles in their life over the lifetime with those with the least. And they found 55% less chance of being diagnosed with dementia in those who had um, more estrogen cycles in their life. So it brings up risk factors. I mean, some of these things are nothing you can do about, right? You know, whether or not you go through puberty or menopause at a certain time, but the factors that decrease your estrogen exposure and therefore may increase your dementia re rate is a later age of menarche, which is your first period, a younger age at menopause, the average age is 51.5, shorter reproductive span. That just means you might still be having periods in your 30s and 40s, but you can't get pregnant, or your estrogen levels are thought to be low for some other reason. Um, and then of course, removal of the ovaries, either during a hysterectomy or just on their own. So it brings up an important point like I said, you can't do a lot about many of these things, except, you know, you can look at your ovaries as an S little estrogen producing factories that you don't want to lose unless you really, really have to. Um, I mean, back in the day when I was first in training, most gynecologists I knew would just take out the ovary just because they didn't want their patient to get cancer later. And ovarian cancer, of course, is awful. And it's really hard to detect in early stages. And that was the rationale but there wasn't enough knowledge about, you know, what does removing a woman's ovary early in life really do to her, you know, her dementia risk, or no one is even asking that question, cardiovascular risk. You know, we know it's detrimental to the cardiovascular system as well as, you know, bone density and things like that. Um, so this was really, really important. The next study I'd love to share with you well, the obvious question is, what about taking hormones? If your own hormones are good for you, what about the hormones that my doctor prescribes to me? So this was another study. This was, uh, doc was Dr. Britton. No, this was not. This was Dr. Mali. So this was a huge study out of Cache County where they followed people. They looked at their endogenous estrogen exposure, um, like Dr. Moscone's paper. And they found the same thing. The more estrogen you are exposed to in your life endogenously, the lower your risk of dementia. 
And then they also look at the people who took hormone therapy. Um, and this was defined as hormones that were prescribed by their physician. And they're all different kinds, okay? So it gets really messy as to, you know, was it a pill or a patch or was it ethanol estradiol or estradiol? That gets messy. But what they did find was that people who took hormone therapy also aged better cognitively, especially if they took it within the first five years of menopause and for long-term over 10 years. So can we go into like, do you recommend? I mean, I, 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 we can't specifically address each person's individual health, but like, what, it, what is your take on hormone replacement therapy? Like a patch, should we, should, would you recommend that? Well, it depends on the person. This is, this is another one of those issues where you have to talk to your doctor. You might want to find a doctor who's really interested in this and has been following the data because honestly, you know, this is something that OBGYNs follow a lot. Uh, reproductive endocrinologists are experts on this. Other doctors may not have interest in following all the little details and the minutia of the research that's coming out. And a lot of doctors are really um, concerned about prescribing hormones because they are associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. So I guess my advice would be find a really good gynecologist, or if you're at risk for breast cancer um, or have had some problems with hormone therapy before, find a reproductive endocrinologist. That's an OBGYN who specializes in endocrine. Um, and then go over your history. Estrogen is not appropriate for some people. If you've had breast cancer, or maybe if you have a very strong family history of it. However, there are still real and measurable benefits of taking hormone therapy around the time of menopause. And now we're adding to that list of things that are beneficial is reducing the risk of dementia. What about um, bioidentical hormones? What, what's your take on that? Bioidentical hormones are a non-FDA approved form of hormone therapy. So there's hormone therapy that your doctor prescribes, it went through the FDA, it's got a black box warning on it that says you could have a blood clot, you could have cancer, you know, all these scary things. Um, when you get a bioidentical, you might get it from a compounding pharmacist, an alternative practitioner, a naturopath, or your MD. And that's fine. They're just not as well tested. I, I look at them as probably weaker forms of what is prescribed as hormone therapy. So my anecdotal experience going through menopause with hundreds and hundreds of women over eight years was that they just didn't work as well for symptoms. Um, but they're still estrogen and they still work fine, but they're probably more appropriate for people with really, really mild symptoms. And then I also don't know if they're potent enough or actually have the same type of actions to have these also these long-term added benefits like reducing the risk of heart attack, stroke, dementia, um, keeping bones strong. So it, it's hard to know because they're not studied and they don't have a black box warning. So they're not as scary. So it makes it very attractive for people. I think they're probably fine and safe though. I just don't know if people are getting the benefits they can get from them. So what about, um, let's say you're a person who can't take um, estrogen. Um, what about eating, eating more estrogen rich foods? What, what's your take on that? Like with more tofu and more soy products? Yeah, you can definitely um, bump up the, the isoflavones in your diet. Isoflavone is a flavanol that comes from whole food soy, like tofu and um, seitan and things like that. And there have been studies on that. Women that do like several servings a day um, can maybe have a reduction in their hot flashes over time. I've had lots of patients try that. I never really had anyone have stellar results with it, um, but honestly, maybe they weren't eating enough of the soy. And the studies, a lot of the studies don't, sh they don't follow people for long enough to really know if it's making a difference. But I would say that the isoflavones are brain healthy nutrients in whole food soy. And they're a really good thing to add to your diet. Okay, good to know. All right, so like, what are you jazzed about? What, what's like, what's like the most cool stuff that's going on in research right now that you that are that's really pumping you up that that you're really happy about? Okay, so we we can talk for like one more minute about menopause and women because <laughs> okay. this is the coolest thing happening right now in um, in sort of brain science research is that we are looking at people's brains while they're going through menopause, okay, the perimenopause is a seven year on average time span where women is experiencing menopause. Um, and they're looking to see what happens to those biomarkers for Alzheimer's, okay? And what makes women different than men? And this gets to this really key question of why do women have more Alzheimer's than men? Why do women who are ApoE4 positive are more likely to become, get Alzheimer's than men who have ApoE4? 
you know, men and women being the same, having the same risk factors, women um, get Alzheimer's five years earlier than men on average. Um, so why is that? It's so important that we figure this out. Um, so what this study showed, this is again, the work of Dr. Lisa Moscone. She looked at um, 120 brains, some men, mostly women. And what she found was that when women were having a lot of menopausal symptoms and their estrogen levels were going up and then they were going down, um, not only were they getting hot flashes and brain fog and things like that, but they're, they're actually accumulating amyloid and tau protein in their brain. So not only does fluctuating hormone levels cause symptoms that are bothersome, it's actually changing the structure of the brain. Okay, and this is like so important to know. It also is changing the way the brain uses glucose, which is our primary source of energy. And so women you know, may, may have this, what's called a bioenergetic crisis, meaning that feeling of overwhelming fatigue you get just like out of nowhere. And that is basically like all the glucose in your brain just being zapped up and not, you can't use it anymore. So these things are important because we are starting to think that there's something about menopause in some women that makes them vulnerable to Alzheimer's, okay? And if you target this, you figure out who these women are, then you can implement all the other things that we know about preventing Alzheimer's and make it so that this doesn't become an issue. Okay, because some people will, you know, have this decline starting at menopause and then it continues down like a curve. Other people, they decline a little bit at menopause and then they kind of, you know, go back up to normal. So we want to know the difference between those people. Who are the ones that are really resilient? Why, why do they come out of it completely intact cognitively? And who are the ones that continue to have a decline? Okay. Is that as interesting to you? <laughs> no, it is. But I mean, I guess it just reinforces a lot of the lifestyle suggestions that that we're gonna continue to talk about. So let's, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, th I think, I, I don't want people to like leave this event feeling like helpless. Hopefully you're gonna feel empowered that we could, you can change some of your behaviors or your habits or add more berries to your diet. And hopefully that will be helpful. So. Yes, yes. So case in point, this is another really um, great area of research. It's, it's boosting flavanols, flavanol rich foods in your diet, dietary pattern. And this was a great study that came out um, beginning the pandemic. It didn't get much press because, you know, COVID. But this was a wonderful study done by the researchers at Rush, some of the same ones who did the Mind Diet study. And they said, okay, we know that the fruits and vegetables and the, the really colorful veg foods are really important for brain health. But why is that? So what actually gives fruits and vegetables their color are plant pigments called flavanols. And flavanols are phytonutrients that are specifically brain healthy. They're extremely brain healthy and they're potent antioxidants. So this group took a group of almost a thousand people who did not have dementia. They looked at what they ate and they broke it down into different flavanols and the different foods that they ate. And what they found that if you're, if you're reaching for a lot of foods that are high in flavanols, your Alzheimer's risk is reduced by as much as 50%. And if you're reaching for certain other flavanols, it's still at like 38% reduced. And so you don't have to remember like camphorol and all these other different flavanols names, but it is good to know which foods they're in, um, like broccoli, like green tea, uh, citrus, um, you know, dark leafy vegetables. This is, I think, uh, soy, I think that's a soybean. It's like edamame or tofu. Pears are really high in isohermentin, olive oil, red wine, things like that. I know I just told you you couldn't drink that much of that anymore, but... <laughs> That was one of the foods that's high in it. So this is a really elegant way to show we're getting, we're starting to understand like what is it about health, brain healthy food that makes us so brain healthy? And it's flavanols. I think that's gonna be a huge part of the research going forward. And it's a great way to approach thinking about your brain healthy diet. Interesting. Any other research? Any other things that are really exciting to you? Let's see what else we got. Okay, so I presented this study when I was in Woodside in 2019. And since then it was replicated, but it just bears to be repeated. It's such good information. It's the power of lifestyle. So we talk about sleep, we talk about exercise, we talk about brain healthy food. All of those individually are studied to reduce your Alzheimer's risk. You saw the data with food, some foods like up to 50%, right? But what if you combine lifestyles? It seems to be a power in combining lifestyles. This makes complete and total sense, right? So in the original JAMA study, they looked at uh, exercise, not smoking, building cognitive reserve, limiting alcohol, and a brain healthy diet. 
And they showed that if you follow four out of five of these factors, your Alzheimer's risk is reduced by 60%. And another very key thing was in the people that were ApoE4 carriers, meaning they had a gene variant that increased their risk slightly for Alzheimer's, they were reduced by 32%. So even the ApoE4 is amenable to lifestyle changes in terms of significantly reducing risk. So a study came out uh, just this year, I think it was two months ago, 300,000 people in the UK. I'm not sure, I don't even know how they did a study like this on that many people, but they, they did these same lifestyle factors, plus they added sleep, six to nine hours a day, and maintaining a healthy weight, which doctors define as a body mass index of under 30. And they showed the same thing, that the numbers were almost exactly the same, both for ApoE4 and for the general population. Can you, um, there was a question about the ApoE4. Do you wanna just talk about the ApoE gene for just a second, just to clarify for people? Absolutely. So um, ApoE4 is what we call a gene variant. It's a risk gene. And you can have ApoE, two different types of ApoE um, that you inherit in your genome. So you can have an ApoE2, a three or four. You can have two fours, you can have two threes, you can have two twos, you can have a two and a four. You get the idea, you get one, you get two pairs, two, two, two to make a pair, sorry. Um, now, if you have one copy of ApoE4, it increases your risk of getting Alzheimer's later by about fivefold, okay? If you have two copies, it increases the risk by about 12 to 15 fold. And that, I know that sounds really awful. And for some people, it does ultimately become their biggest risk factor in terms of ultimately getting Alzheimer's. But having a copy of ApoE4 doesn't mean you're gonna get Alzheimer's. Honestly, most people with ApoE4 don't get Alzheimer's disease. So the math is kind of um, tricky there, but um, people are starting to test it more and more because if you have a family member with Alzheimer's disease, especially, you know, the, we're talking about the late onset, not the early onset, then it's possible that you could also have an ApoE4 gene variant. Um, a lot of the studies that I read that I, I find so optimistic and so positive for, you know, the, the real life takeaways is that there are foods we eat, there's dietary patterns, there's things that we can do like exercise um, and modifying the way we drink alcohol that can turn off this ApoE4 gene. And the more you follow just these, you know, these general brain healthy lifestyle guidelines, if you have ApoE4, the more like, the less likely it is to be expressed throughout your life, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, any other lifestyle? I think there was another study, right? Yeah. The other, the other one, the other study that was just going to be aware of is the Lancet Commission, and this is kind of busy, so I'll break it down for you in a second. But the Lancet Commission um, convenes in the UK. It's basically a, a, a board of Alzheimer's experts throughout the world. Uh, they previously met in 2017, and they look at all of the modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's throughout the world. So in the world today, there's 50 million people living with Alzheimer's, right? Um, so if you look at this, they like to look at preventable risk factors and they break it down into early, mid and late life. Um, interestingly, the having less childhood education in early life is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease that's becoming increasingly important. Now, these little numbers here that I don't think you can really see very well, it, that's the amount of Alzheimer's in the world you could reduce by eliminating this risk factor. So in the perfect world where every child had an adequate education, we'd see 7% less Alzheimer's worldwide. That makes sense. That's what these numbers mean. So what's new is they added three midlife risk factors. All of these have been um, described before. I don't know, can you, can you guys, can you see this genie or is it too small? It's a little small. Okay, so I'll just read them. So hearing loss, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. There's a study that came out this year that showed if you correct your hearing loss, then your risk goes back down too as if you didn't have it. So that's really important to know anyone who has hearing loss or is putting off getting tested for hearing. Um, traumatic brain injury is new. This was just added. Um, having had a traumatic brain injury can increase your risk of dementia later in life. If we got, if we removed traumatic brain injury as an issue, we would reduce 3% of all the Alzheimer's in the world. Amazing. The other one is hypertension, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, they added alcohol, which they were a little bit late to the game to add alcohol to their list of modifiable risk factors, but they did based on kind of this new data that was coming out. Um, air pollution was another one that they added, and this affects older adults more than adults at midlife. 
So if we eliminate the exposure to pollution, we reduce 2% um, of the Alzheimer's in the world, which is pretty stunning. A really, really cool paper came out um, last year looking at women who live in cities who are exposed to daily air pollution. And that if they eat a certain amount of fish in their diet, that it reduces that risk back down to as if they didn't live in a polluted environment. Mm. How cool is that? And it's thought to be that the DHA in the fish is protective of the brain, especially from this, these small particulate matters that people are exposed to. Interesting. So um, we're all patients. And so let's say I'm going to my doctor next week for my yearly checkup. What are some of the things I should be, what are some questions I should be asking my doctor in terms of things I should be studying and know about and things that I should be aware of for brain health? Absolutely. So before I go to the next slide, I'll show you that this, there's a, here's a risk factor. Diabetes is listed here. That's been known for a really long time. Um, hypertension, which is high blood pressure. That's been known for a really long time. Those are a couple of things to, to key in on. Ah, there we go. Okay, so blood pressure. I don't know if everyone is aware of this, but blood pressure guidelines have actually changed over the last couple of years. We used to say 140 over 90 was def defined high blood pressure. Now we want your blood pressure to be under 130, under 80, and ideally more in the 120 over 70 range. So um, the longer you have high blood pressure in your life, the greater your risk of dementia. So I think this just goes to people who have you know, this borderline blood pressure. I saw it so much in my patients where they would come in and it would just be a little bit high, like maybe, you know, maybe 140 over 70, maybe it was 130 over 80, something like that. Um, and you don't know if it's because they're in the doctor's office and they're stressed or they're running in late or whatever. But anyways, um, if you have had borderline blood pressure readings, I, I would get a home blood pressure cuff. I would track it. I would just be really strategic about figuring out if you have blood pressure or not, because it's emerging as a very important risk factor for developing dementia later in life, both Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Um, and this is really important in the African-American community um, where hypertension is predominant as a cause of dementia later in life. And there's a really interesting study that came out last year. I put it on my Instagram. I can share it with you guys if you want um, in the notes or something. But show that if, if you addressed high blood pressure in Black Americans, you would reduce their Alzheimer's risk down to that of a Caucasian person. So a lot of it is, is high blood pressure issues and not, not treating that as well. A lot of borderline blood pressure you can treat with um, lifestyle modifications like diet, exercise, cutting back on salt, and sometimes medication is really necessary too. So and that's can... super important. Uh huh. And then our blood sugars we should be paying attention to? Um, so we've known for a really long time that, you know, if you have diabetes, adult onset diabetes, your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia is greater. And we know that Alzheimer's is, has um, one of the its causes is insulin resistance. It's probably one of the more important causes that leads to an environment that becomes Alzheimer's. So we used to say that, you know, if your fasting blood sugar was borderline, like between 100 and 126, you know, we would just kind of keep checking it to see because it's not really a diabetes diagnosis, it's called prediabetes. But now papers are showing that prediabetes increases your risk of Alzheimer's too. Mm -hmm. So just like the blood pressure, if you go in and you know, you've had some borderline blood sugars that are kind of high, um, I wouldn't ignore that. I wouldn't just repeat it in a year. I would really try hard to get that number under hundred. I might just be making some dietary changes that are really simple and easy. Um, about when you eat or what you eat and really try to get that down. And also, if you want more detail, you can ask your doctor if it's appropriate to have a hemoglobin A1C test. And that is a test that looks at your average blood sugar over the previous six weeks. It's a lot more accurate than just testing it in one day. Um, so hemoglobin A1C can sometimes also be helpful. I think it's for three months, right? Isn't the hemoglobin A1C? It's the lifespan of the red blood cell, right? Is it three months? I think it's in OB, we used, we used six weeks. Um, um, <clears throat> I think it's three months, but yeah. Um, so, you know, our big message, both you and I, we share all the time is, you know, eat, eat the rainbow, eat more plants, eat more nutrients. And let's say we're not, you know, what can we use for insurance? Like in that vein, what, what supplements perhaps would you, um, 
recommend? I mean, if we're not maybe getting it in our diet or just to have a little extra boost, what would you, what would you, what, what, what's best for brain health? Well, this is such a good question because I got so many questions about this um, before the talk and I continue to get them like every day. So I have a couple slides about that. And, you know, one of the supplements I really want to talk to you about is DHA. Most of the supplements that are marketed to you for brain health don't have a lot of, you know, science behind them, honestly, but DHA actually really does. So there are three omega-3 fatty acids. Everyone's heard of omega-3s, right? These are the polyunsaturated fatty acids in our food supply, abundant in fish, et cetera. And there are three forms, DHA, EPA, and ALA, which comes from plants. Like and our body can't make them. So we have to take, we have to eat it. Yes. So these are called essential fatty acids because our body cannot manufacture DHA. We can manufacture cholesterol. We can manufacture lots of things, but we cannot manufacture DHA. We have to get it through our diet. It's crucial. It's a critical brain health nutrient, um, especially DHA, EPA as well. So food is the best source. And I put this uh, diagram up here for you so you could see how much DHA you get in certain types of fish. Um, fish and seafood are a really great source of DHA, as I'm sure everyone knows. Um, salmon, especially wild caught salmon, has large amounts of DHA. Um, you know, also bivalves like clams and oysters are really high in DHA in a bioavailable form. Okay, it's like the type of form that actually gets transported across that blood brain barrier and gets incorporated into cell membranes where it can um, limit oxidative stress and kind of improve the lifespan of each brain cell. So food is the best source, but not everyone has eats fish, not everyone has access to high quality fish. And honestly, it's just so important that like, I'm starting to recommend that everyone just supplement with DHA because it's so important in brain health nutrition and preventing Alzheimer's disease. We know that people with a low DHA, which you can measure in the blood through a red blood cell test, um, have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia by about 70%. Um, so it's actually kind of crucial that we pay attention to this nutrient. So if you go ahead and get a supplement, make sure that you get DHA and EPA in a ratio of three to one. That's because DHA is the most active one. EPA is also important, but you want it to be mostly DHA, okay? You want it in the phospholipid form. And you can look on the bottle, it should say, if it's an ester or triglyceride form, it's probably getting um, broken down into what's called a free DHA, not bound to anything. And it's not getting transported across that blood-brain barrier like, like you want. Um, so this is really important. And it's one explanation why a lot of the studies on supplementing DHA and brain health have been mixed. Some show benefit, others don't. Um, you know, the studies use all different types of supplements. So it's, it's an issue of quality control with the supplement. So I would do a phospholipid form. Um, the dose depends on how it's bound. So that's a really, that's a moving target too. You might find a dose that's like a couple hundred milligrams and you look and say, oh, wow, fish has so much DHA, but my supplement only has a couple hundred milligrams. It's really not the same, okay? Um, you can't really get a ton of DHA into a capsule. These are long chain fatty acids. They're really long, they're kind of bulky. And as you know, from, you know, it's the recommendation for eating cold water fish, it's, it's coalesced in the fat cells of the fish. So it's actually kind of hard to stuff it all into a capsule. Um, but if you have a high quality form, that's what you need to, um, to supplement your diet. And look at the source. DHA can come from all different things like cod liver oil or whatnot. Um, a high quality fish source is ideal. Um, fish roe is ideal. As you can see, roe has you know good amounts of DHA or krill. Krill oil sometimes is what you'll see. Any other supplements we should be paying attention to? Okay, of course there's gazillions of supplements that people are trying to sell to you. Um, I'm not putting these here because I recommend them. It's actually the opposite. Um, another one that I do recommend though is vitamin D. Vitamin D is really important for brain health. We know that people with Alzheimer's disease have very low levels of vitamin D. In their, in their bloodstream. You can measure that at your annual exam. You can get a vitamin D level to see if you're absorbing the vitamin D that you take, uh, which I do every single year when I go in. So look for a D3 form, um, look for at least 5,000 units a day and take your D with food. So vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. D, E, A, and K are all fat soluble vitamins. It will be absorbed better into your body if you take it with some fatty food like take it with your fish or take it with your avocado or take it with um, you know, anything along those lines, a little bit of olive oil with your food. 
Um, I want to talk about L-serine because it's really, um, I get a lot of questions about this and there are some ongoing clinical trials about L-serine, not so much with Alzheimer's, but with some other neurodegenerative diseases. And that's currently being studied and uh, you can look up the research of Dr. Paul Cox, uh, which is super interesting and compelling. But as of now, I'm not recommending that anyone supplement with L-serine. Um, the flavanols that we talked about, this is, this is a new hot area, not only in brain health research, but also in supplementation. For example, the group in Cornell who uh, studies and takes care of people with APOE4 uh, gene variants, they just came out with some recommendations as to what these people, what should you, should you eat, what should you supplement to optimize your risk of not getting Alzheimer's. And they mentioned quercetin, which is one of the flavanols, resveratrol, which is another one, um, and there's a whole list of other ones. But they're saying that these are so important that you might want to supplement them as well, is including them in those foods that we just talked about. We already went over MCT and coconut oil. I do not recommend. Uh, ginkgo was promising with memory studies, but none of these studies were done very long or very well. And so um, I'm not recommending ginkgo for your memory or anything else. Uh, turmeric, you know, you can get turmeric or curcumin in a capsule form. It's probably fine. I would recommend that you uh, consume it through foods because it's going to be more bioavailable. Uh, turmeric or curcumin, the active ingredient in turmeric, also needs to be absorbed with some oil. You know, like, so if you cook it with some olive oil or something else, it's going to get much better absorption. And also black pepper increases the absorption of curcumin by about a thousand percent. So sometimes you'll see curcumin plus black pepper in a pill. You know, if you don't like using turmeric in your cooking or it's just too much, do this all the time. Then I another, think another fine. word for it. it was like, what is it? Isn't it piperin? Yeah, piperin is the active ingredient pepper. Um, ginseng studies have been really disappointing. Magnesium uh, might help you sleep. Uh, it's an important brain health nutrient, but if you're eating a, a fairly good diet, you're gonna get plenty of magnesium in your food. I don't think you have to go out of your way to supplement it. But a lot of supplements will include that too. Any supplement that is basically um, marketed to make you more alert or smart or do better in school or do better on executive functions and testing is, is probably not worth your money, honestly. Probably has some caffeine in it or L-theanine. Um, which is a, another form of, um, is another molecule in, in coffee. Um, and I mean, I don't know if it's harmful or not, but I don't think it's really going to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's. So I think that's maybe near the end. Do you, do we have a summary slide of what to eat? Is that the next? So, so my on brain healthy food, if you put it all together, brain healthy food has a low glycemic index. Most people I think know what that means nowadays, right? It means that it's low in sugar, high in fiber, won't spike blood sugar insulin levels. Get, again, getting down to that you know, insulin resistance issue. It's low in saturated fat. Like we said, the most dietary patterns that are brain healthy are less than 5% saturated fat. It's rich in mono and polyunsaturated fats. The mono is what you get from the olive oil, from avocados, from nuts, from seeds, from lots of the um, brain healthy food groups. The polyunsaturated ones are the DHA and the EPA that you get from fish. It's packed with antioxidants. See all the colorful, colorful plant nutrients here that's, you know, you can just see all the flavanols in this dish, right? It's mostly plant rich. Um, I don't know if this is cutting it, but three quarters of your plate, I would like to see plant rich, um, mostly plants, you know, like whole grains, leafy greens, nuts and seeds, vegetables, herbs, other things like that. Um, eating a brain healthy diet is it's not a diet, it's a, it's a pattern. I believe that you can choose your own dietary pattern based on you know, what you like to eat, um, based on your ethnic heritage, based on you know, the traditions in your family and what feels normal to you, what food is a good fit for you. I think that you can create your own dietary pattern within these guidelines. It doesn't have to be look exactly like the Mediterranean diet. It could be an African heritage diet or an Asian heritage diet using traditional foods, um, as long as the guidelines are mostly met. And most, and most importantly, it doesn't eliminate food groups. The only food groups you wanna eliminate on a brain healthy diet are the junky and ultra processed ones. That stuff um, needs to be taken off the table, you know, out of the kitchen, out of the pantry, just really try to get rid of those foods in your life, get them out of your food environment so that you're not tempted to reach for them because they're marketed to be tasty and addictive and make you keep coming back more like a potato chip. Um, I can't have potato chips in my house because I like them so much. <laughs> so case in point. Um, but if you try to eliminate like, you know, those junky processed foods, and we all know what those are, um, you're going to be doing really well towards uh, reducing your Alzheimer's risk later in life. 
there we, we received a few emails and then there's a question here. Um, can we, do you know anything, any, anything come out in the literature about COVID and how it's gonna impact the risk for dementia down the road? Maybe yeah. related to systemic inflammation? Yeah, I've been reading about that. It's actually, um, it's not very optimistic news. Uh, I don't have any slides about that because I'm still just sort of accumulating the knowledge and trying to form an opinion on it. But when you think about it, you think about like the influenza, okay? Um, when you get the flu, just a normal seasonal flu, you get a certain amount of brain fog with that, right? Sometimes you get sensitive to light. It, it's really affecting your nervous system and your brain. Um, and one of when we were talking about the blood brain barrier not being quite so tight as it, we learned in medical school, um, I think that when you have a viral infection, um, inflammatory particles pass through these blood brain barrier junctions and they get into your brain and they cause inflammation. And that may be why there is data that shows that the more flu shots you've had in your life, the lower your risk of Alzheimer's. That data came out last year. Okay, makes sense, right? The, the more flu shots you get, the less likely you had the flu many times in your life. I'm sure we've all had it sometimes, but um, it redu actually reduces the risk of Alzheimer's. So it remains to be seen how big our problem this will be. Great. Um, there was a question about reversing hearing loss. I think you're just referring to using hearing aids, correct? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about cochlear implants. That study just really looked at the mechanical uh, you know, uh, hearing aids and things of that nature. Yeah, yeah but really important. Okay, um, so on the MIND diet, the only fruit that's specified is berries. And you mentioned because that's what's been studied predominantly, but now you're talking more about the flavanols and um, citrus was in that little category. So someone's asking, is citrus recommended? So I, I imagine yes, because- Absolutely, I actually use a ton of citrus in my recipes. There's a lot of citrus represented in the book that's coming out next year. And I use a lot of citrus rind um, because the flavanols are concentrated in the rind. And lemon zest and orange zest and lime zest are you know, delicious. They can add like a ton of flavor and you know, give you like a huge boost of flavor to your foods. And it really just takes like an extra couple of seconds to get out the grater and do it. Um, but I'm a huge advocate of that because of the flavanols in those food. And you know, there's a huge tradition in Mediterranean countries, especially Italy, where my relatives come from, of using citrus in foods. And it's thought that the citrus might also have some synergy with the other plant foods in terms of helping absorb the other nutrients in the food. So I look at it as a synergistic food as well. So I recently, I'd say like a year ago, I started um, actually cutting up lemons and roasting it with my vegetables. It was a recipe and you eat the entire lemon, like huh. everything that's in it. And it's super tasty. So I recommend that if, if y'all haven't tried it, but actually roasting some of the citrus is, is is, yeah, roasting yeah. it, also um, making preserved lemons, like you demonstrated on Instagram recently. I love using preserved lemons because it's both a ferment, a lacto-fermented food, and um, it's got a ton of fiber, and then you get all that citrus. You just eat the whole, you eat the whole rind when you preserve it. Um, question, what does being on the pill for a long time do? For brain health? Yeah. It, likely it's an overall positive because it controls your estrogen levels by giving you a constant even dose. Um, while you're on it, rather than rapidly fluctuating ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how about there's not a not a big mention of dairy in the mind diet, other than the small amount of cheese that's allotted. So, what about like Greek yogurt and other dairy products for brain health? I mean, I, th I think that I think that yogurt is a great choice. You know, I don't consume a lot of dairy since these guidelines come out because dairy products are, you know, one of the biggest sources of saturated fat in the American diet. And so you think about how we smother everything with cheese and you go to restaurants, everything's smothered with cheese. It's hard to get away from it. Um, people drink milk, even though they're like adults, <laughs> like milk, milk is important for children, no, maybe not so much. Um, and so, yeah, I think that if you're going to consume dairy products, which is fine, um, small amounts, high quality, organic, um, unsweetened. I think Greek yogurt is great because it gives you more protein. I'm always trying to get a little bit more protein in my diet. So I like Greek yogurt as well for that reason. Um, but I mostly am using plant-based um, milks, cheeses, and things like that. I do like really good um, feta and Parmesan, which can give food a you know great pop of flavor. It's like a it's a flavor bomb. You know, you can use a small amount with to great effect. So I, I do use cheeses strategically, and I don't think they're you know bad for you when when used that way either. 
I think one thing to just point out, and I, I know you talk about this in your Instagram and whatever, but just pay attention to the yogurts. If you are eating yogurt that, you know, pay attention to the added sugars in it. So eat it, eat plain yogurt, but add some berries or some fruit in it. If you need to sweeten it would be my yeah. recommendation. Mostly loaded with added sugar. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. like, like plain full fat yogurt. Um, I actually use full fat yogurt. I don't have a problem with my cholesterol. If I did, I would probably use a low fat yogurt. Um, mm -hmm. However, I like the full fat yogurt because it helps with the absorption of all those anthocyanins and things in the berries. Okay. Um, just kind of, how about sesame oil? Sesame oil I would use in small amounts, you know, like a flavor bomb. Um, mm -hmm. The roasted sesame oils can rack up a lot of what we call advanced glycation end products in the, um, in the process of processing it. Um, so I, I would probably stay away from the roasted ones, except maybe a drop or two if you really love it. Um, look for a super high quality, cold pressed organic sesame oil and use it as a flavor enhancer, not as a cooking oil. Okay. Um, so you, you, sh you talked about like the biomarkers and so is it mainly through MRIs that we are seeing the, pl the amyloid plaques? Is it through PET scans? Can you kind of go through the imaging that is used to evaluate these different biomarkers? Um, sure. I mean, you can measure it in the cerebral spinal fluid. That's how a lot of these studies are done. They do. You know, so actually doing a spinal tap. Spinal tap. Mm -hmm. And that's how they did a lot of the studies on glymphatics that we talked about. Um, MRI is, I'm not an expert on this. Okay. So I'm giving you a little caveat, but what I've seen in the studies that MRI is better for looking at brain structure, like volume is the brain shrinking. Um, is the hippocampus shrinking, things like that. PET scans are better at looking at metabolically active brains. Mm -hmm. Like, is it using glucose normally? Like Alzheimer's brains have a different uptake of glucose. And also, um, you know, is there amyloid places that look like amyloid areas? Uh, PET scans are, um, what I think is the gold standard for looking at amyloid in the brain. Okay. Um, I think that's kind of many of the questions we addressed and um, thank you so much. I hope everyone got a lot out of this experience. I learned a ton and I hope everyone else did and follow her, be on the lookout for her cookbook. You wanna plug, do a little plug on your cookbook a little bit? <laughs> or no? All I can say, it's coming out in fall of 2022. I don't have an exact publication date yet. We're still about a year out. Um, the, the title is to be determined by my publishers. We're still talking about it, but something along the lines of the Brain Health Kitchen. Um, and I wanted this book, there's a lot of science in it. Um, as you might suspect, I really, I really love that aspect of brain health. But this is a cookbook that I want people to pick up and see the gorgeous photos and see how easy these dishes are and just really want to cook these foods and make them again and again and to make the recipes your own. So it's really a cookbook for cooks and for people that want to cook more. Great. So in that vein, then we'll end it at this. What, what, what's like your go-to meal that you might cook tonight for dinner? Oh, my go-to meal. So usually what I do is I look and see what kind of vegetables I have on hand. And if I had a working oven, which I still don't, I'm still waiting for my replacement, <laughs> I would get out a sheet pan and I'd roast a bunch of vegetables with olive oil, some salt, and some pepper, maybe some spices. Um, right now I'm doing it in a, like a big, a large skillet basically with olive oil. And then I usually do a batch of whole grains and a batch of beans every week, which I do in my Instant Pot or my slow cooker. So I usually have some quinoa or some farro in the fridge or some forbidden rice, which are three grains I really like. Um, and you know, some beans that are freshly cooked or cans of beans. Um, so usually what I'll do is I'll start with the vegetables and then I'll nestle some protein either in the sheet pan or in the skillet. Um, that protein could be tofu that I've seared in a pan to get it crispy, so it's really delicious. Or it could be um, you know, a piece of chicken, it could be a piece of meat, um, it could be a scallop or shrimp piece of cod, and I might add some broth and spices. And then I just, I just cook that all together, serve it with grains. Um, if I want to serve beans on the side, I'll add olive oil and some spices, whatever goes with it. Um, that's, that's kind of pretty simple. Sounds pretty yummy. Simple. We're all coming to your house tonight. For dinner. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much again, Annie. This is lovely. Uh, follow her on Instagram, Brain Health Kitchen. Follow me, Soul Food Salon. And we'll just keep trying to spread the good word of eating better for brain health and for overall body health. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jeannie. And thanks everyone for all your great questions.